There was a time when Georgia ran on water. We're taking you on a journey to the past, from brightly painted mills to weather-beaten ruins covered in vines, some of the prettiest places in the state stand as monuments to the way we used to do business. Before electricity, gas, and oil powered America, the wheels of commerce were turned by water. Along many Georgia streams and rivers lie remnants of a lifestyle when nature determined the placement of development. Every little village had its own grist mill. More than a century ago, close to 1,200 of these mills turned water to grind corn and grain for Georgia farmers. The mills became the social centers of every little town. It was pretty on the water, and grinding the corn or wheat could take hours so as children splashed in the streams, people waited their turn with gossip and laughter passing the time. Some of these mills are still standing, charming reminders of days moved not by computers or cars, but water. For those who know where they are, the mills are still a draw today. When you find such a place, it is like taking a step back. Your body breathes a sigh of relief as the sounds of simplicity invade your senses. In the mountains of Northeast Georgia, this mill has served local folks in Rabin County since 1820. Since then, Barker's Mill has been rebuilt and renovated several times, but it is still powered by water from Barker's Creek, brought in on a 12-foot wheel. Water wheels were invented by ancient Greeks, and though there are variations to the structure, the technology hasn't changed much. Here, the water is channeled to the top of this wheel, which rotates when falling water fills the buckets and the weight then pushes the wheel forward. Woody Malott is a physics teacher in Rabin Gap, but he comes from a family of mill operators that dates back to the 1750s. The original mill served the first white settlers that came into the Clayton area. Today, Woody still produces whole grits and meal that come from a locally grown corn unchanged from the seed brought in by the first settlers. Not only did they provide a service to grind the grain, but they were also a source for seed for next year. They were a source for, you know, stories about news, what's going on in the community. I mean, because when this was running full time, I mean, it was running five or six days a week. And, you know, in the mountains, it was hard to, it was hard to get news from one end of, of the county to the other. And it was the mill that was the spot for news. Not far from Augusta, we floated downriver, escorted by a dog, and found the Ogeechee River Mill on water that bears its name.
Quakers first dammed the river at this point back in the 1700s. Each grist mill operates a little differently, but all of them use a method of trapping water to run their machinery. At Ogeechee, a trap door is pulled up, releasing water into an underground chamber. The rushing water turns those turbines. You can see the one on the right beginning to whirl. The turbines begin a chain of action, moving a series of belts, wheels, and pulleys on the upper floors. Missy Garner bought this land for her cattle ranch, never expecting to get a mill as a bonus. Well, we moved up here and um, just to have a different farm. We were poultry farmers in Florida, mm -hmm. and we just kind of wanted to do something different, and this came along with the cattle farm that we purchased on the other side of the river. This is an animated antique. Missy's crew had to figure out how to fix anything that broke on a system that shakes the whole building when it operates. Cracked corn is fed to pipes that slowly work down to moving stones. Those stones grind the corn into meal or grits. After so much cornmeal goes across it, it'll smooth this out and it won't grind properly. And so you have to take these stones apart and you have a little chipping hammer and you peck at this and chip it up called glazing the stones. The miller wasn't given any cash for his service. His payment was any meal that fell to the sides. Missy produces cornmeal and hush puppy mix, but it doesn't generate much income. The real treasure is the mill itself. Located in the tiny town of Mayfield, it's been around since 1847. It was also a cotton gin and a general store. Books dated 1896 document the sales. $16.50 for one red heifer for the, for the loan. For the loan. In yeah. other words, if I don't pay you back, you get my heifer. That's right. A pair of shoes sold for $1.75, and tobacco was a hot commodity. There's one um, entry in here, and it says, plug a tobacco. 10 cents, and in parentheses it says, don't tell wife. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a great, that's great. Nothing ever changes, that's, does nothing it? Nothing ever changes. <laughs> don't want her to know I'm chewing tobacco. <laughs> Ogeechee River Mill doesn't grind that much these days, but it is still a social center for the community. West of Marietta, we found ruins of a different kind of mill. An 80-foot waterfall powered this three-story building in Polk County. In 1843, Elias Hightower built this mill with slave labor and stone. It sat above a cotton gin, all of it powered by the falls from Uharley Creek. On the first floor, huge stones ground wheat and corn. Union soldiers camped here, but spared the mill. The land is now owned by Carol Crook and her husband. The specialness is the serenity. And I love it when people come from the big city, Atlanta, and uh, drive all the way out here, an hour away, and are so astounded by the beauty of nature and just to spend that couple of hours with their family, enjoying the serenity of it. God created a beautiful place with this, with the waterfall, and uh, people seem to really enjoy that serenity and that beauty. Another stone mill sits on the campus of Berry College, just north of Rome. It looks like something from a fairy tale. You half expect the Keebler elves to be inside making cookies. The 42-foot water wheel is said to be one of the largest in the world, and the inner mechanism was donated by Henry Ford. The Henry Ford? Yes, the Henry Ford. Really? Mm -hmm. And this was used 
like for food. Oh yeah, this was, Berry schools were committed to self-sufficiency and so they grew all of their own food and they needed a place to grind their grain so uh, this was constructed as a place to grind the grain that was grown at Berry schools. Um, the uh, mill building itself was constructed by students as were most of the buildings on the Berry campus. So this is a very holistic type of, of campus. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think a lot of people know that. It's the largest campus in the world. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that either. We have 26,000 acres right here. An entire mountain, all of Lavender Mountain is part of the Berry campus. When Georgia settlers learned to control water, it changed everything. Soon there were bigger operations, from paper mills to textile plants. The ruins of these businesses are scattered across the state, outlines of our first industrial parks. Historian Charlie Crawford says Soap Creek near Atlanta used to be a bustling area. This was a paper mill, and during the Civil War, the Southern newspapers were desperate for its product. By the time of 1864, many of the newspapers from farther north in the south, so to speak, like the Memphis paper and the Nashville paper and the Chattanooga paper had moved to be within Confederate territory because now they were behind Union lines. And so, like the Memphis appeal, was actually published in Atlanta at that point. Nearby on Vickery Creek, Roswell Manufacturing was a major textile mill. The water was dammed and forced through a mill race. That's a trench or stone structure that forces water through channels to create a constant rush of energy. But the Roswell Mill was making Confederate blankets, and Union soldiers burned it down. The mills on Soap Creek were burned as well. General Sherman's men burned anything that could be used by Confederate troops. One of his objectives was to destroy any industry that might be of use to the Confederate government. Now, in many cases, he would leave a flour mill because he was uncertain how long his own troops would be here. And if they were here for a prolonged period of time, they might need flour. And so he didn't destroy every flour mill, but a paper mill or anything that was essentially superfluous to his efforts, but yet might aid the Confederacy was fair game. It's hard enough to imagine people busy at work along these peaceful waters, let alone soldiers marching through and setting their business on fire. At Sweetwater Creek State Park, you can see the haunting remains of New Manchester Mill. It was a huge textile operation, and at five stories, it was the tallest building in the Atlanta area. Union soldiers tore out all the machine belts so the mill couldn't operate, then came back a week later and burned it down. The women and children who worked here were taken to Roswell, and along with the Roswell mill workers, they were all shipped up north and left to fend for themselves. An interesting side note, Union soldiers were able to take Atlanta by crossing the Chattahoochee on an old fish dam. You can still see the zigzag structure, likely built by Cherokee Indians. The bridges were guarded by Southern forces, but not that fish dam. And until Union soldiers crossed here and went on to take Atlanta, Abraham Lincoln thought he might lose his re-election bid. Probably the fall of Atlanta, if it didn't guarantee Lincoln's re-election, made it much more certain. 
and Lincoln's reelection meant the North was going to prosecute the war to the end, and the South wasn't going to get to negotiate a peace. It was going to have to give up. Another mill that burned during the Civil War was in a town that simply disappeared. An 1870 photograph shows a large cotton mill near Thomaston called Waynemanville. Its remains are on private property, hidden in the woods along Tobler Creek. Researcher Martha Clayton Lee spent years tracing the history of the mill and a forgotten village. The largest configuration of this mill complex was probably the one that was built in 1870. So this was a huge mill? Yes. There were 60 to 125 operatives working in this mill, and the associated mill village ranged from about 150 people to 250 people. In its day, the mill made high-quality cotton and thread. There is nothing left now but these walls and the babbling brook, which has worked its magic for hundreds of years. Despite Martha's background in architecture and mechanical engineering, even she is mystified by this structure. First of all, it's just an astonishing engineering feat to have been able to dry lay rocks of such mass and irregular configuration and get a stable structure out of it. It represents a technology largely abandoned now, so that even the best educated among us stand here and still are puzzled by exactly how the work was done in the structure we see. Water needs to fall at a sharp angle to get enough power to drive machinery. So gradually, mills popped up any place a body of water made a steep drop over rocks and ledges. One of the best examples is at Banning Mills in Carroll County. Historian Doug Mabry says the Snake River Gorge made this a prime site for an industrial corridor. It's hard to look at this place now and, and call it an early industrial park, which is what it was. The gorge is only about a mile long, but there, in a one mile there's seven dams and over a dozen different sawmills, grist mills, paper mills, pulp mills, uh, a tannery, just all this. Uh, in this one gorge. The dams are still here, and the old cotton mill stands proudly over the water, a tribute to the community that once thrived. Today, Banning Mills is a conference center best known for its zip line adventures, but a walk along the water is still one of the prettiest places to spend a day. It's a walking tour through history. Imagine, this was once the top producer of paper in the South, and those mill operators knew how to work the river. So they had the two water wheels in here, then the water would come out and run right, went straight into the uh, creek. So it went right back, back in, went downstream. Well, they carted it the next dam and used it, and well, they carted the next dam and used it. So it was just the water. They got their money's worth at the time the water got to the Chattahoochee River. It had been used for industrial power over and over. Mills became more advanced and began to spring up along the fall line where the soft, sandy coastal plain drops sharply from the rest of Georgia. Macon, Augusta, and Columbus developed large textile mills. Columbus built dams to direct the power, and Georgia made sure it controlled the water. These mills come in the 1840s, and the city actually did the investing. The city controlled the land and created a, a, a water power system, which was basically a canal that ran along the Georgia side. Now, for your lesson in Georgia history, Georgia gave up Alabama and Mississippi to the federal government. And when they did, they drew the boundary. So we're standing in Alabama, but if we step over this railing, we're in Georgia. Because Georgia comes to the high water mark on the Alabama side. 
By 1860, as the Chattahoochee flowed past Columbus, it powered three textile mills, a big grist mill, and a very large sawmill operation, all, of course, on the Georgia side. But the mills closed, and the dams were no longer needed. Getting rid of the dams will completely change the face of downtown Columbus. John Turner is part of a group convinced an unleashed river could revitalize the city. By restoring the river, we would be, um, in effect, releasing an, an amazing river that had been impounded for the last 170 years. The first blasts have already created fast-moving water, and developers are just getting started. The river that gave birth to Columbus may soon give it an economic shot in the arm. This setting itself is, is interesting. If, if you look out here, what, you're, what you see is the precise place where the fall line enters the coastal plain. And it's, it's that um, geography that is the reason this city is here in the first place. The river is navigable in that direction and not navigable in that direction. Rapids created by breaches in the dam are already a draw for kayakers, and the old mills are transitioning into upscale condos. Water and mills, they helped shape our country and continue to play a role in the state today. Water remains a critical part of doing business, and debates about how to control it seem never ending. The mills left standing rejuvenate, inspire, and still serve as community centers. Stars Mill is one of the most photographed sites in Georgia. The cherry red structure has been featured in magazines and movies. It's easy to see why. This looks like a postcard. Bobby Curlin says there has been a mill here since about 1822. Everything operated around the mill. There were country stores, uh, the church next door here. Uh, there was a cotton gin where people brought their cotton to be ginned. So it's always been a, a center of activity for the whole community. Located on Highway 85, southeast of Peachtree City, Starr's Mill was purchased by the Fayette County Water Department in 1991, and the mill pond is a source of drinking water. Perched above Whitewater Creek, it is still home sweet home to many people. These are indeed special places. After hours in traffic or a day in front of the computer, this is the place to be. Words written in the 1800s ring true. Listen to the watermill through the live long day how the clicking of its wheel wears the hours away. There are a lot of these watery retreats throughout the state. I hope we've been able to encourage you to leave your laptop at home, skip your routine, and find a special spot of your own. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time.